السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه، أما بعد Brothers and sisters, Jazakum Allah khairan for inviting me to come here today. Um, I usually start off by, you know, making everybody mellowed out a little bit, crack a few, not jokes, I don't like cracking jokes too much, but, you know, what I say tends to be laughed at, so just leave it at that. Um, you know, I notice a lot of you, since I arrived, the brothers that picked me up, they seem really tired, they've been writing a lot of assignments and handing in papers preparing for exams. When I got here, it seems like everybody else is in the same mode, so I'm like, why did they invite me to come now? <laughs> Everyone's going to fall asleep. So, you know, I'm going to have to try and make this a little lively for you, inshallah. Uh, myself included, it's the end of the semester. I have a lot of papers due as well. And when Saad called me up last week, I was like, you know what? No. <laughs> just straight up, no. And he goes, you know what, Dad? Uh, just get yourself a nice cheesecake or something and take 24 hours, think about it, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Tomorrow, And I'm like, okay, sounds reasonable, you know, cheesecake, why not? <laughs> so, alhamdulillah, uh, I decided why not come back. I love this university, mashallah, not the actual university, I don't know anything about it, but I love the brothers here uh, and the sisters for the sake of Allah. And, you know, I'm just really happy to be back. Jazakumullah khairan. Brothers and sisters, something came to my attention. Something really strange, while at the same time very disturbing. I noticed from listening to some of the brothers speaking on my way here, and you know, by spending a few minutes before this lecture, that there have been a few incidents that have taken place here on campus specifically, uh, whether between Muslims or between non-Muslims. And this is something that we all need to wake up and smell the coffee. Okay, it's time that we wake up. It's time that we realize who we are and what we are here for, what we have been placed on this planet for. And this is what we're going to talk about today, inshallah. We're going to talk about why we are here. What is our purpose? It's time to wake up. It is not, you know, we wake up in the morning, we go pray Fajr, I'm going to talk to you about the importance of Fajr. No, I'm not going to talk to you about Fajr at all. I'm not going to talk to you about Salah. I'm not going to talk to you about Fiqh. Okay? I'm going to talk to you about something more important. And what is more important than anything else in our religion? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to spend this next hour, inshaAllah, talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if we don't realize who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, we will not be able to realize why we do anything in our life. Why is it that we are studying? Why is it that all of us have you know, bloodshot eyes, we're all tired from writing, writing assignments? Why is it that we're doing this? Why are we striving so hard? What is the struggle for? Is it worth something in this life or not? And in order to make it worth something, we have to understand why we're doing it. And the only reason why we do anything is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So everything that we do in our life is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But do we really love Allah? Ask yourselves, do you really love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now I want everyone to Whoever agrees with me, okay, whoever loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, please raise your hands. Okay. And this is a question that is not to be taken to offense by anybody, just so that I know, so that I can gear my lecture accordingly. Um, I want to know if anybody here is not a Muslim. Somebody who is not a Muslim, please don't feel shy, just let me know. Because that way I can word my uh, translations better so that you'll be able to understand. For example, if I just say Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will not know what I'm talking about. So if anybody here is not Muslim, please just raise your hand or you know, gesture so I know. Okay, so everybody here is Muslim. Okay, Jazakumullah khayna. So brothers and sisters, do we really love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I want you to think. Have you ever lost a loved one? I want you to think, you know, you're sitting here in Malaysia and your families are in another country. <clears throat> Most of you, I'm sure probably all of you. And you are on the other side of the world. Sometimes you run into financial problems. Sometimes, you know, you just want to buy something new. You 
may want a car because it's easier for you to walk up that hill coming to UNMC. Or you may, you know, just have run out of money and you can't buy any food. And there's somebody back home, whether it's your mother or your father or brother, a sister, a relative, or a really close friend that is always there for you. Somebody who, you know, through thick and thin is always on your side. I want you to think of that person. Visualize them in your mind for you right now. And think of this person and keep that thought in your mind. Now imagine if that person, when you walked out of this room right now, after this lecture, you receive a text message, because I'm sure all your phones are switched on silent right now, right? You receive a text message, and that text message says that that loved one of yours just passed away. That person that you, you know, look to for support, whether it was emotional support, financial support, or any kind of support, had just passed away. How would you feel? How would you feel if you lost your mother or your father? How would you feel if you lost a brother or a sister, or your husband or your wife? How would you feel? Now, keep that in your mind. I want you to think of these things throughout this whole talk. I'm not going to bombard you with a lot of information, but I want you to think. I want you to just ponder over what we're talking about. That person, they used to help you come over trials, you know, overcome your trial. Now you're faced with the trial of losing that person that you loved, that person that always helped you. How are you going to overcome it? How will you get through the next day? How will you get through tonight? You have assignments. You have exams. How will you do it? Who do you put your trust in to help you through these rough times? If your trust is in somebody other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, this will be a very hard and very difficult task for you. But if you put your trust in Allah, and you always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make things easier for you, and you ask Allah to help you, then this trial, this hardship that you're faced with, will be overcome very easily. But you need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is only with Iman that we can overcome these hardships. So we're going to talk a little bit about Iman. Our topic today is about building our Iman a little bit. You know, a wake-up call, when we talk about waking up in the morning, what do we do? We go and pray Fajr. That gives us that Iman boost for the rest of the day. And for those of us that have a hard time getting up for Fajr, we feel, you know, our day is lacking in something. And the brothers and sisters that get up for Fajr, you know, and they, the brothers who go to the masjid and the sisters who wake up for Fajr on time, they feel like, you know, they started their day on the best thing ever. They prayed Salat al-Fajr. So we're going to talk about that today, insha'Allah. We have to prepare ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Ra'd, verse number 28, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب Verily, it is with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the hearts find rest. The hearts are at peace. So we seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help during these hardships. Correct? Now, if I was to tell you that, you know, we're sitting here and we see somebody walk by and we're like, this person is a dead man walking. What do you think in your mind? This is a dead man walking. Now today, with the media and everything, you know, we're starting to think, oh my God, somebody's going to kill him. This is not good. We shouldn't be talking about that. But we're not talking about that. We're not talking about somebody who is about to be killed. We're talking about a dead man walking, meaning their heart is dead. Their heart has no iman in it. They don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or they believe in Allah, but that's it. You know, those brothers and those sisters that say, Allah knows what's in here, and they go on their day. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who don't have Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't believe in Allah, they, they don't put their trust in Allah, they say it with their tongue, but they don't actually believe it. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for us if we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He makes us as though we are living people.
people walking on the earth. We are not dead people walking. And a good example of a dead man walking is, for example, a doctor. Okay, doctors are not dead men walking. Don't get me wrong. I know a lot of you are studying, you know, to be doctors or in whatever field, medical doctors or engineering, whatever it may be. Now I'll give you a very simple example. My brother this year, he was admitted in the hospital. This was in about February, April, something like that. He was admitted in the hospital. He had a doctor. His name was Dr. Shainer. He was a really good doctor, very old, over 70 years old. And he was a Jewish man. He didn't believe in Allah. This, this doctor, this doctor did for my brother what my brother said, you know, with tears running down his eyes, saying that this doctor, even though he knows I'm a Muslim, and even though he's Jewish, and we have so many differences and with the media today, what's going on, he still goes out of his way. His wife is sick. The doctor's wife is sick, and she's about to pass away. She has cancer, I believe. And he goes out of his way, because my brother had been admitted in the hospital twice, and he realizes this is strange, that someone that at this young age is having this kind of difficulty. So he comes from his house in the middle of the night in order to treat my brother, in order to operate on him. In the middle of the night, when he doesn't have to. But my brother, he finds this amazing and intriguing. Why is this person, who's not a Muslim, coming and helping me? And he does all these good things. And this person saves people's lives. Maybe for the past 40 or 50 years he's helping people, saving their lives. But is it worth anything? in the hereafter? Is there a purpose to your life if all you're doing is helping people now, but you do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the hereafter? Is there a purpose to your life? Now some of you are thinking, well, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not forgive such a person who's been helping many people, including the Muslims? Well, I'll give you an example. You own a business, and in your business you have two employees. One employee, he always shows up on time. He's always there. You open at 10 o'clock in the morning, he's there at 9.30. He's sweeping the floor, he's you know cleaning the windows. He's always on time. And the other employee, he's a little bit lazy. For 30 days during the year, he's fasting. And he comes in at like 10.30, 10.45. And you know, when he comes to sales, with the customers, you know, half the time he's sleeping, he's got bad breath for 30 days of the year, you know, and he, he's kind of lazy, and he leaves early sometimes because he says he's too tired. But the difference between these two employees is that the one who's always on time and makes all the sales, at the end of the month, when he goes to deposit the money in the bank for you as the owner, there's always about 25% of that money missing or 30% or 50% or whatever you want. But the other person who's always half asleep, who's tired, who comes to work late, who never helps clean up, when it comes time to depositing the money, every single penny, every cent is accounted for. Now how would you, as a store owner, being the boss of these two employees, how would you treat these two? You would look at the one who's always on time and say, you know what, you're always on time. So what? I can't pay my rent if you're stealing my money. So what good you did for me is useless because you're doing so much good, but in the end, I still have nothing. You didn't appreciate what I gave to you. But the other one who was always late, but he would always deposit his money on time and every single penny was accounted for, that employee, you would tell him, you know what, you slacked off, you're a little bit lazy, you know, you make mistakes, but you're a good employee. I like you. You give me all my money back. You know? So the two employees are human beings walking on this, this earth. One of them has Iman in his heart and the other one doesn't. And the one who doesn't have Iman, he's doing all this goodness. But in the hereafter, all that goodness is worth absolutely nothing because you did not do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you didn't please the one that created you. But the one who was 
lazy and came to work, you know, 30 days of the year with his bad breath and so on. You know, it was it was tough dealing with him as an employee. But you bought your BMW because of the money that he deposited in your bank account. And you bought the big house, and your children went to school and colleges and universities, and you were set. You were set. So the two are different, and I hope you guys can see that. If anybody can't, then please ask me about it later on, inshallah. Iman helps us to differentiate between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. So the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim, there are many different aspects, but one of the most important ones is Iman. This is the difference between a Muslim and a non-Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nisa, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu, aminu billahi wa rasooni, aminu billahi wa rasoonihi wal kitab al-ladhi nazzal ala rasoonihi wal kitab al-ladhi anzal min qabl. وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states for us in the Qur'an those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the books that were sent down and the scriptures and the, day, and, and the angels and the day of judgment those are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And indeed, those who do not believe in that have strayed far, far away. So the difference between one who believes and does not believe is a drastic difference. And this reminds me now, I'm going back to the beginning when I said that there were a few incidents that happened, say on campus or off campus, I don't know where it was, but the brothers were just telling me about certain things. And I don't know who's involved, so please don't, you know, don't attack me. <laughs> but all I want to say is that, you know, for somebody who has Iman, if you do not agree with another brother or sister, whether they're your brother or sister in Islam, or another uh, a guy or a girl outside of Islam, you know, a non-Muslim, you do not have to resort to violence. You do not have to resort to solving the problem. And one of the things that's very interesting, my younger brother taught me this. He goes, you know, in Canada we have this issue where people, they come up to you and they just, because you may look like a Muslim, you may have a beard on your face, even though you're Hindu or Sikh, but you have a beard and you are a turban, people think you're Muslim. Okay? So, he told me this trick. He's like, if someone comes up to you and they start telling you, like, get out of our country, Muslims are terrible, do this, do that, you know, they start ta talking to you really bad. He tells me, he goes, don't say anything back. He's like, what's wrong with you, man? Why are you arguing with people? Don't say anything back. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm just giving them a little bit of doubt. He's like, no, the best thing to do is just smile. Just smile. And I started thinking, you know, it was like, the Prophet ﷺ told us, smile, because it is a form of charity. And when somebody's really upset at you, try this next time. Someone's really upset at you, they're getting in your face, just smile at them. And they're going to want to punch you. So after you smile, run the other way, okay? <laughs> and if they're really getting in your face, just laugh like you did. Laugh like they just told you a joke and walk off. They're going to get so furious at that moment. They'll be really, really furious. Well, what's going to happen after that? The next day or a week later, they're going to think, what that guy, I was talking to him so bad, and all he did was smile. He didn't say anything back. He just smiled at me, and he walked off. And he's going to start to wonder, why did he smile? Why did he just do that? Why didn't he fight? You know, Muslims are known, oh, they're like crazy people, violent people. Why didn't he do that? Personally, I never fought a fight in my life. Alhamdulillah, I never got into any fights. Usually when someone says something to me, I just walk off. And when it really gets to me because of like talking to my wife or something, you know, and this happens to me a lot, in Canada especially, people come up to you and tell you, you know, take that leash off your wife, don't treat her like a dog and stuff like that, you know, it's like, that gets to me. But my brother tells me, he's like, just calm down, man, just, just laugh. And you'll see the difference. I'm telling you, try it, you'll see the difference. Brothers and sisters, at times of distress, we always turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And this is something which is not hard to do at times of distress. I'll give you examples. Picture this. You're on your flight going back home to your country. Okay? I'm sure everyone here has been on a plane before, even if you're just traveling back somewhere else. You're on your plane, and you're traveling, right? You're watching a movie, you're eating your food, you're listening to music, you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, okay? And all of a sudden, while you're sitting there chilling out, boom, the plane drops. It doesn't go to the ground, it just drops like a few hundred feet or 50 feet. Turbulence, okay? Really, really severe turbulence, it hits you. What is the first thing that you hear echoing throughout the cabin of the airplane? Oh, I... Sorry? Oh my god! Okay, that's exactly it. When I, when, I, when I said this at UIA, everyone yelled it out at the same time. Everyone was like, oh god, that's exactly what you hear. Now imagine, like everyone's sitting here in rolls and it looks like you're inside a cabin. And all of a sudden, that plane hits serious turbulence. Like, really, really bad turbulence that the... the flight attendant who's walking down the aisle, the car goes racing to the back and smashes into the door. Everybody yells out, oh God, or oh my God, you know, or Jesus, or something, whatever they believe in, but they, they call out to God. Correct? That's a time of distress. And that just proves to us the fitra. The fitra. The natural way that we were created. And I came up with something very interesting with regards to the fitrah. If we translate fitrah into English, what are the words you can come up with? Natural disposition. Natural disposition. Anything else? Any inclination. Sisters? Natural inclination. Okay. Inclination. Anything else? Fitrah. Yeah. Instinct. Instinct. Okay. Sometimes. Sisters. Nature, okay, I came up with this really good term. And it fits perfectly. Default mode. <laughs> right? Everybody has one of these. A cell phone. Right? I want you guys to interact, right? When I say right. Yeah. 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 Woo! <laughs> right, yes. Don't just, you know, I don't want interaction, man. I feed off of the way you, if you guys are half asleep, I'm falling asleep. Seriously, like my eyes are burning now, I want to go to sleep. So everybody has a cell phone in their pocket, bag, purse, you know, hands. Some of them are texting right now in the back there. They're like, man, this guy sucks. Get him out of here. Don't invite him in. Okay. Everyone has a cell phone. Yeah. Who here <laughs> has owned a Nokia phone before in their life? More yes. now. Nokia. I got the N97. <laughs> All right. One thing that's unique on the Nokia, and this is why I'm asking about Nokia, when you change all your settings, right, and one day you get fed up with all your settings, and you're like, how do I change it back to the day? How, how do I change it back to how it was the day I got it? Back to default. Back to default. Back to, default. Back to, default. Back to default. No. Default mode. Yeah. You put it back to default mode or factory settings for those of you that have Sony's. So you put your phone back to default mode. Default mode is how your phone was created, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's like, assignments to finish. <laughs> so you put your phone back to default mode and now what happens? It runs just like the day you got it, right? Perfectly. You send text message, in three seconds, boom, message sent. Whoa, this is good. Someone calls you, their picture shows up right away, whoa, it's working fast. When I had all the settings, it was like, send a text message, gotta wait 30 seconds, finally sent, now I can type another message, you know? So when you set your phone back to default mode, it goes back to the original state. It starts to work faster. It wipes out all that nonsense that you had on there, all the pictures and movies and ringtones and whatever. It wipes it all off, and you now have a clean phone. Human beings came in a default mode as well. 
not built by Nokia though. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in the most beautiful and most complete way. No other being that walks on the face of this earth has what we have. We have a brain. We have common sense. Some philosophers say we don't have common sense, right? He's telling me that. But we have common sense. And we came in a default mode. And when times get really bad, you know, and you're in the turbulence of that airplane, everyone rewinds their lives into default mode. And they start going back to God and asking God to help them and praying. And for those that don't pray to God, they usually lean over and they're like, excuse me, are you a Muslim? Yeah. Can you pray for me that, you know, this plane, nothing happens so we can land safely? Just be grand sure. You're Muslim, right? Yeah, please pray for me. You see that. You see that on the planes. I travel a lot. I get it. Trust me. It happens. Okay? So this default mode that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in is what we are trying to go back to. We're all, always trying to get back to our default mode. That is like someone who goes for hajj, and you know everyone says you go for hajj, you come back, the slate is wiped clean. Okay, it's like you're a newborn baby. You want to go back to that newborn baby status. And sometimes you feel like you've committed so many crimes in your life. You feel like what you've done, there's no way. It is absolutely impossible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you. Well, guess what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive you. And will, inshaAllah, forgive you. There's only one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive. And I'm sure most of you know what this is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive shirk. He does not forgive those that render partners to Allah. Whether it is through intercession, you know, you're seeking help from an idol or, or a worldly god or something. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something through that person. Going to a grave, worshipping the grave. All of these things are no-nos in Islam. Okay, we do not do that. And in order to reset yourself to default mode, you have to rid yourself of it. You have to get away from all these bad things that you were doing. But always remember in the back of your mind, you can always go back to default mode. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to go back to default mode. It is only up to you to do it. It is up to us. If we want to clean that slate and wipe it clear and start off fresh, we have to. Just do it. Just do it. That's all you know, people who wear Nikes know. Just do it. Brothers and sisters, I'll give you an example of somebody who is in a way related to me, um, who just passed away about a week ago. This is uh, my mother's sister, so my aunt, her father-in-law. Okay, so my aunt's father-in-law, or my uncle's father. He's not Muslim. By the way, for those of you that are wondering why I keep saying certain people are not Muslim, uh, my mother accepted Islam, so my mother is the only person in her family that is Muslim. Everybody on her, on her side of the family is not Muslim. So, her, uh, my aunt's father-in-law, okay, he just passed away about 10 days ago. And before he passed away, he was in a hospital um, receiving treatment. He was 102 years old. And he was laying down on the hospital bed, and his daughters, who are not Muslim as well, came, and they were sitting on his bed, you know. They're elderly as well, maybe around 60, 65, 70 years old. And they're singing songs to him, the same songs that they sang when they were little kids, that he used to sing to them. Okay, this is a non-Muslim household we're talking about. And they're sitting on his bed, singing these songs to him and all of a sudden you know at the end of each song he smiles and he just says you know go on so they start to sing another one and they continue doing this doing this for a couple of hours at one point in time he he sits up off the bed and he just yells out his his wife's name his wife passed away a few years back he yells out his wife's name and he lays back down and passes away. 
His daughters that were sitting with him said that before this happened, he was having a really hard time breathing. And every time he finished, they finished a song, he would like cough, be like, <coughs> and they thought it meant, you know, keep singing, keep singing. But what do we know from reading the Sunnah of the Prophet That the soul of a non-believer, the soul of a non-Muslim, when it is taken out, it is ripped out really, really hard. It comes out very, very tough. And so, when I heard this story, I asked my mother, I said, describe to me, keep, keep going, describe to me, like what happened, what, what was going on? And it sounds exactly like what we read in the seerah. When someone's soul is ripped out, they're in so much pain. And this is a man who's dying, and he's in so much pain. And then he's about to die, and his soul is just coming out, and what does he yell? Does he yell out Allah? Does he yell out La ilaha illallah? He yells out the name of his wife that passed away like 20 years ago. Is that the way that you want to leave this world? Do you want to leave this world not remembering Allah? Do you want to leave this world with people sitting around you on, their, on your bed singing songs to you? Do you want to leave this world struggling with your soul pulling it as it's being pulled out? Is that the way you want to leave this world? I definitely don't want to be this way. And I don't think anybody sitting here wants to. The fact that you all showed up here means that you're looking to wake up. Because you're all falling asleep right now. You wrote a lot of assignments. And you want to wake up. So let's wake up a little bit, okay? Us, as human beings, we are proof of creation. We are proof of creation. We are created. And for those that say, we are not created, there is no creator. Well, let me ask you this. As human beings, okay, we're either created out of nothing, or we're created out of ourselves, or somebody created us. Now you take the first one. Either we are created out of nothing. So you're trying to tell me that you're created out of nothing. Where did you come from? Nothing. Okay. So if you say you're created out of nothing, a human being is about to just plop out of the floor right now. Alright? It doesn't make sense. If we created ourselves, then that means we would be cloning people today. And obviously, we're not cloning anybody because they still haven't figured that out. And they will never figure that out. There's no way you can clone another person. Okay? And that leads us to the last one, which means that somebody must have created us. Okay? There has to be a creator. And this creator is not a human being. This creator is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This creator is the one that gave us, as I said, something unique that no other creation has. The ability to differentiate between what is right and wrong. And the ability to differentiate between when we are supposed to do something and when we are supposed to hold ourselves back. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted us with. We know that we are not created by ourselves. We know we did not just magically appear out of the ground. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Now the fact that He created us means we have to fulfill certain things. And one of the things that we have to do is put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. I ask you now, if you're sitting down after this lecture, you're sitting down outside, what's that restaurant called? DSA. DSA? You're sitting down by the restaurant. <laughs> okay, because a lot of you don't know what a restaurant is. Okay, so you're sitting down by the restaurant, and while you're sitting there, a fly comes and lands on your food. Yum. Right? No, it's disgusting. <laughs> this fly lands on your food, and you don't brush him off right away because you're putting food in your mouth, and then you look down and you realize, oh, there's a fly on my food. So you go to brush off the fly. But the fly ate some of your food. He ate some of your food. How are you going to get that food back from your fly? You're going to beat him up? Like, yo, fly, come on, man. You're going to do that? 
I even give him Heimlich maneuver, like <laughs> trying to get that food out of the fly. What are you gonna do? There's no way you can get that food back, and there's no way you're even gonna try to get food back from a fly. You're not gonna do it. Why? Because first of all, it's such a small amount. Second of all, even though it's such a small amount, probably won't even harm you, you don't want to eat food that came back out of the stomach of the fly. Okay? But my point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that fly. And if you say that you are, you know, capable and you have powers to do certain things, well I ask you, or you ask those people that say those things, the exact same thing I just asked you. To get your food back from that fly. And see what they say. Try, try and make them come up with some strange thing. I'm sure Adnan's gonna try it. He's <laughs> <laughs> probably in, like writing down right now, like, "Yep, I'm going to eat after. I'm gonna look for food. <laughs> look, look for people who have flies in their food. <laughs> I'm not gonna wait for the fly to come. I'm gonna look for people who already have a fly." <laughs> oh, sure. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet sallallahu said. Whoever's last statement is La ilaha illallah, dakhal al jannah. Whoever's last words coming out of their mouth is La ilaha illallah will enter jannah, will enter paradise. But at that moment, as you know from the story I just related, it is very, very hard for a person to say La ilaha illallah when they're struggling with their soul. So this is why you have to live every single part of your day according to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to. And I told you, I'm not going to talk about fiqh, I'm not going to talk about salah. I'm talking about using your mind. I want you to recognize the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala around you at all times. Recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. He created those fish that swim in that pond out there. He created those beautiful birds. I saw birds there. I don't know if any of you saw it, but I saw birds drinking from the water and the rain. It looked so beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created those birds. Why? Why did He create them? Why did the rain come down? And for some people that rain is terrible because they have to walk in and it gets soaked. But for other people, they look at it and like, mashallah, it's a beautiful day. It's raining. It's beautiful. The rain is nice and cool. It's not so hot and humid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created those things as signs for us to recognize the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His abilities, His strengths. He gives, He takes. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after this rainfall that just fell, if He stopped the rain from falling for the next 50 years, what would happen to Malaysia? What would happen? You study what, ecology or something like that? Environment. <laughs> Environment, yeah. Uh, no, no shade for us. No shade? Plants would die. The plants would die. There's a, there's a, there's a, turn into the desert. What else? Famine. Everyone would leave. Go back. Nothing would be able to survive no. except for a few species. And that's it. And that's the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with rain that sometimes we complain about. Sometimes the rain is falling and we're like, subhanAllah, this rain, man, when is it going to stop? <laughs> And you laugh, but it's true. The reason why you're laughing is because you know you've said it at least once before. <laughs> I say it, you know, sometimes I say it and I catch myself like, subhanAllah. You know, sometimes I remember when I was in Saudi, because I lived in Medina for a number of years. Sometimes it would rain once for the entire year. The entire year. Trust me, when it rains that one time, everybody's out in the rain. Everyone's like, yeah, it's raining. I'm coming to pick you up. <laughs> Everyone's like going to pick up their friends or driving in the rain. It's beautiful. It's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those that don't have it, they realize what they were missing. And for those that have it, they will never realize its importance until they lose it. Until that rain is lost. And everyone has to sell their property. And everybody sells their cars. And everyone closes down their shops. And they move away from this life. You only realize the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you lose something, when you lose a loved one, as I said in the beginning. You realize the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That person is gone. There's nothing on the face of this earth that you can possibly do to bring them back. You can cut open their chest, put in a heart from someone who's alive, dead. Change their lungs, dead. 
take off their toenails and put on nice toenails and nice fingernails. Dead. Give them a you know artificial hair implant. Still dead. There is nothing that you can do, absolutely nothing that you can do to bring that person back. Nothing. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who takes and it is Allah who gives. And nobody can touch that power. Brothers and sisters, Musa alayhi salam, sticking with La ilaha illallah. Remember we said whoever dies in their last statement is La ilaha illallah, dakhala jannah. There's a lot of explanation that goes with that. You also have to believe in La ilaha illallah, we're going to get to that, inshaAllah. Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses, he used to be able to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, correct? Correct? Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to wake you up. I'm going to do some activities soon. I'm not going to throw any heavy bags at <laughs> sisters or anything like that. <laughs> like last year. Musa alayhi salam, he was able to talk to Allah, okay, the Prophet Moses. He could talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once he turned to Allah and he said, Ya Rabbi, I want, to te- I want you to teach me something that I can call you upon, or call upon you. Teach me something with which I can call upon you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, he says, O oh Musa, say la ilaha illallah. So Musa alayhi salam, he's like, O oh my Lord, the entire creation says this. Everyone says la ilaha illallah. I want something specific, something special, something that I can call you with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Musa, say la ilaha illallah. And then Musa alayhi salam again says, Ya Rabbi, I wanted something that is specific for me, not something that everybody else already says. I want something for me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Musa, say la ilaha illallah. The third time. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Musa, know that the entire creation was placed, if it was placed on one side of a scale, okay, we had a scale, and we put the entire creation on that side of the scale, and you took this kalima, la ilaha illallah, and you put it on the other side of the scale, it would outweigh the entire creation. La ilaha illallah would outweigh the entire creation. Solutions. So brothers and sisters, I need to wake some people up. I noticed they're sleeping. They didn't listen to what I was saying. Brothers and sisters, this kalima la ilaha illallah is very important. Very heavy. And I will give you an example of how heavy this kalima la ilaha illallah is. Because some of you are thinking it is just something which is recited, something which is written down. La ilaha illallah. I will tell you the hadith of the 99 scrolls. Who does not know this hadith? Who does not know the hadith? Okay, that's better. If, if everybody knows it, I'll just walk home. <laughs> okay? So the hadith of the 99 scrolls, there was this this man on the Day of Judgment who was brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? This man will be brought in front of Allah. And he will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order the angels to bring the books of bad deeds of this person. And they will be in the form of scrolls. Everybody knows what a scroll is, right? It's like pieces of paper rolled from both ends and you unroll them, okay? These scrolls, 99 of them, if you unroll them, each one goes as far as your eyes can see. So you look to the left and all you can see is the horizon and your scroll is just going over. And you look to the right and you see the horizon and that scroll is just rolling over the horizon. 
and there are 99 of them. 99 scrolls of bad deeds, of sins that was committed by this person. 99 of them. 99. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask that person, do you deny that these are not true? Do you deny that these scrolls of your sins, all 99 of them, rolled out to the edges of the horizon? Do you deny that these are not true? And that person will say, no, I don't. It's true. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask, do my angels do some kind of injustice by collecting these scrolls from you? And the person will say, no, they don't do any injustice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask a third question. Do you have something good to show me? And the person will say, no. I don't have anything good to show you. Nothing. Not a single good thing I can show you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, yes. You do have a good deed. You do have a good deed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order the card to be brought. What is this? Can somebody tell me what this is? Business card. Business card. In Arabic, we call this a bitaqa. Right? For those who didn't speak Arabic, bitaqa. This is a business card. It is a card. This is the hadith of the bitaqa, the 99 scrolls, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask the card to be brought forth. And on that card is written, La ilaha illallah. That's it. La ilaha illallah. This card, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show it to the person and they will see La ilaha illallah written on this card. And Allah just finished telling the person you have one good deed. But you're looking at these 99 scrolls and you're like, 99 scrolls of bad deeds. One little card that says La ilaha illallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will order those 99 scrolls to be put on one side of the scale. And when they are placed on that one side of the scale, He will ask the angels to place this bitaqa on the other side of the scale, this card that says La ilaha illallah, not this actual card. <laughs> this is a friend of mine in Canada. He will ask for this card to be placed, and the angels will place it on that scale. Look at what happens to this card when it falls. This card says La ilaha illallah, correct? Yes. When this card falls, doesn't it look like a feather from a bird that just falls? But this card with La ilaha illallah written on it, on the Day of Judgment when it falls on that scale, on that side of the scale, it will outweigh the 99 scrolls, throwing them up into the air. That is how heavy that person's bitaqa, their card of La ilaha illallah will be on the Day of Judgment. This does not mean written La ilaha illallah. It does not mean you walk out the door and say, I believe in Allah, La ilaha illallah, I'm good, I'm set, I'm going to paradise. You actually have to believe in it. You have to live your life according to La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah has to be running through your veins. It has to be something that you want, something that you see and you appreciate. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at this auditorium and you think human beings built this. But everything that is here was provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The technology that we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided it. The shoes that we wear came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The hair that grows on our head, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The eyes that we see with, the nose that we smell the beautiful food with, the taste buds that we taste beautiful like mandi and shuaya and whatever it may be that you're cooking for supper later on. It tastes good. All of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illallah. Recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is something that we have to do brothers and sisters. This card of La ilaha illallah is something which, you know, some brothers thought, okay, keep this in my wallet because I want, you know, to have a lot of money in my, my pockets gonna be heavy or something. No, this, 
It's not why I keep it in my pocket. This is for, you know, a, an example, because I use this example a lot. Iman, brothers and sisters, as the Prophet وسلم, is 70 something levels. There are over 70 levels of Iman. The highest level is La ilaha illallah, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fulfilling the requirements of this deen, this religion that we follow. And the lowest level of Iman is to remove something which is harmful from the walkway, from the pathway of others. So if you're walking down the street and you move something out of the way that may be harmful to somebody, that is making your bitaqa of la ilaha illallah heavier and heavier and heavier on the day of judgment. But if you do not do those little things, smiling to others, being polite, avoiding fights, you know, doing good things, spreading good amongst you, amongst your co-workers, your fellow students. Those are all things which will make this bitaqa fall heavier than a feather. That is what we're working towards, brothers and sisters. Now I want you to ask yourselves again, do you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Do you really love yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. Yes. Now, this is something you have to ask yourselves individually. Um, is anybody here married? Is anybody here married? Soon, soon. You have a wife. Nobody. And you guys need to set up some marriage thing. I told you this last year. You have like... Okay. At least half of the brothers can get married tonight. At least. <laughs> well, at least. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I, I want to use somebody as an example, somebody who's married. But there's nobody married here. Is anybody engaged? Ashka. <laughs> Cameraman. No, no, I need somebody who's not shy. Somebody who's like, yeah, I can speak in front of others. Adnan. Yeah. 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 Adnan. <laughs> Who's engaged? <laughs> okay. Okay. So Adnan over here. Okay. For the sake of this example, Adnan, you and I are standing here. Okay. Pretend. Pretend. That we're a married couple. <laughs> Just pretend. Are you shy of me? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I can No. Oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Okay. So pretend for the sake of this example. I am your wife. <laughs> You're the husband. Oh. I'm the wife, you're the husband. We're standing together over the waters of Lankawi. You guys have been to Lankawi. Yeah. Yeah. You had to at least see pictures, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So Lankawi, nice sand, right? Beautiful sand. We're standing with barefoot, no shoes on, beautiful sand between our toes. And the, and the water is nice and blue. And it's glittering. And in the distance, you see where the door is in the distance there, you see the sun. The sun is setting. And I want you to describe for me the beauty of that sun. Okay? And relate it to me as, as a wife. Be like, you know, oh, my dear wife, my beloved wife, to you, and just, just say something romantic. <laughs> 
beautiful wife. When I see you in the morning, when I wake up in the morning, when I see you in the morning, it feels as if the sun had just risen. And when you leave me, you go for your work, or I go for my work. It feels as if the night has come. And oh my God. <laughs> just a hope in my heart. Just a hope in my heart. I just need to work with God. I just need to take lessons. So, I leave you. I have a hope in my heart that I'll see you again tomorrow morning. <laughs> My love is like the radiance of the sun. It's so diverse, just like the different rays of something. Cheers. <laughs> Sisters? He's not married yet, okay? Yeah. So. Whoa, 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 we're not done yet. <laughs> okay. He has some questions. He doesn't want to stand next to you. What kind of husband is that? Having to protect his wife. So you just described your love for me by watching, you know, yeah. the sunset over the horizon, Lankawi, blue water, nice and warm, sand between our toes. Okay. So you, you really love your wife and that, that scene is like something, you can't wait to take your real wife there, right? Yeah. <laughs> that all of you really yeah. <laughs> You're making fun of him, but you want to do it yourself. You know? <laughs> We're going to ask the sisters, is there waiting for a guy <laughs> to do that? None of you are probably capable of it. Oh. Okay. Oh. This is why you have to get married tonight. <laughs> okay, so now, after the husband describing his love to his wife by watching the beautiful rays of the sun radiate through the horizon and glitter off the water, the, husband says back, uh, the wife says to the husband, You know what, dear? I love you 99%. And I love the neighbor one percent. I'm gonna go to the neighbors. Second wife. Wait, right? He's going to the neighbors. Second wife. No, not second wife. He has to take care of the first one first. Yeah. Take care of business. You see, you see what I mean, brothers and sisters? Our love cannot be ninety-nine percent for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be 100%. If you're loving Allah 99%, how do you think Allah feels with you? When we just use an example of a husband and wife, and the husband wants to go and like, you know, it's time to open up a, you know, a fight or something. It's time to do something. That's how the husband feels. How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels when you, in your actions, in your behavior, in the way that you live, you only show less than 100% of love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you feel? How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels with you? The amount of love that you give Him, and then the amount that you give to others. Zakallah khair for I hope everyone got that. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this is why it is important for Adil and Adnan and Sa'ad and all the brothers to get married. <laughs> Just remember this, okay? When you get married, remember of the 99% and the 1%. And two years after your marriage, remember the 99% and the 1%. And when you have a child, remember the 99% and the 1%. And try to put those things in your life. All of these things that you that you hear, that we talk about together, just remember them. And the most important thing to you, the one that touches your heart the most, write it down. Take a card, someone's business card that you're probably going to throw in the garbage. Take it, use the back of it to write something that touched your heart. Make use of that piece of paper that's in your pocket doing nothing. Take it out and write something important on it. And keep that with you. And take it out every week. And just look at it and read it and try to implement that thing in your life. That is how you're going to increase yourself in building a stronger Iman, inshaAllah. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't want to take up too much time because 
I know you love question and answers. So I just want to give you two more examples, and then we'll uh, get into that. I want all of you to imagine. Imagine right now. You know, you wake up in the morning. You graduated from the United uh, University of Nottingham. You, you're living in another country, first world country, so-called. Okay, and you're living in that country. You're a businessman, a businesswoman, a doctor, a lawyer, whatever it may be. You get up in the morning. You get dressed. Put your hijab on. You look good. Comb your beard. Put some gel in it. Okay, and you leave. You make your stop. Your morning stop. This is what you do every day, Monday to Friday. You make your stop at Starbucks. I'm just using Starbucks for the example. Okay, and you make your stop there. You get your coffee. Double shot latte with caramel with whipped cream on top, hazelnut with some nutmeg, and you name it. Okay? And you're walking to work, you got a gelled up beard. You walk into the office and you start work. You're on the third floor or fourth floor of this high rise building. And while you're working, whether it's an earthquake or an airplane or whatever it may be, that building crumbles to the ground. You're sitting at your desk one second before it crumbles. And you're just doing the same thing you do every single day. The exact same thing. But now that building comes down on you. And you're, you, you know, the building crumbled and you're probably on the ground level now. But you're still alive. You're still alive. But you're laying underneath that rubble. All that, you know, cement walls have crumbled and there's bricks everywhere and you're stuck underneath what is the first thing that you're going to do in that situation what would you do what would you do remember god remember god what would you do remember allah just pray for me what would you do make dua, make dua. For Ask for help. Sisters, uh, first sister right there, what would you do? Pray to God. You were sitting up in the back there wearing the big glasses, what would you do? Pray? Uh, Uthman, what would you do? Say Shahada. Say shahada. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's good that we have these intentions that we want to do this. But honestly speaking, when a building crumbles, you think you're sitting down right now, and this building crumbles, what would you do? You cry for help. Thank you. <laughs> okay, when I asked you the first time, what would you do, you start thinking. But if the building came down, what would you do? You would yell. You'd be like, help! Help! Someone come and help you, right? That's what you want. You want someone to help you. It's a natural instinct. Okay? But now you picture yourself in that situation. You're yelling and screaming and nobody's coming. Now you start thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you're stuck under there. Nobody heard you. Nobody saw you. Nobody even knows you're under there. In fact, there are probably hundreds of dead people lying around you. But you survived. But you're stuck. And you start to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You start to pray. Before you started to pray, before you did anything, you could have been one of those dead people laying next to you because of injuries from the fallen walls and ceilings. But you were alive. So Allah gave you that opportunity to think of Him again and to recite the Shahada, to say La ilaha illallah. Now think, you're stuck under there for five days. Nobody even knows you're there. But they're digging and digging and hope to find somebody. And this happened recently in Turkey during the earthquake. And they found somebody, I think after five or seven days, he's still alive. They found someone underneath that rubble. That is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To find somebody still alive underneath the building that just collapsed. That is a blessing from Allah. But what is more important is that the person is there and there's nothing with them except evil, corrupt, destruction around them, the building collapsed, there may be fire, there may be water gushing, 
And all these things in our minds are real terrible and real bad. We don't want to be in that situation, right? So you're left with one solution. Turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When all doors have been closed, all doors have been closed, there's only one way out. And that way is with Allah. So when you have many doors of evil, this door has evil, that door has evil, that door has evil, you can go and take any one of them. But when you close all the doors of evil on you, there's only one place where you resort to. And that's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So by closing those doors of evil in your life, by staying away from things that are haram, by staying away from evils, by interacting with people in a good way, spreading goodness, being kind, being nice to others, and avoid all kinds of evil, whether it's cheating, stealing, lying, uh, you know, anger, all of those things. Close the doors, there's only one door left for you. That's the door of goodness. And that door leads you straight into Jannah. Success. Nothing left for you. No evil, nothing. Just goodness is left for you in this life. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ said that he swore by Allah. He says, I swear by Allah, I have left you upon a clear road. Its night is like its day. No one can deviate from this road except the one who is destroyed. Now picture yourself. You're driving... I forgot your name. Okay. Hassan. Hassan. Hassan has a Beamer. Okay. BMW. But you're not driving Hassan with BMW. You're driving a brand new BMW. Or a brand new Mercedes. <laughs> it's not because your BMW is bad. I love it. But you're driving a brand new one. There's no problems with it. And there's no reason for any mistakes to go wrong. Or any problems to go to, to happen, sir. No reason whatsoever. So what you're doing is you're driving down the highway going to KL. And it's daytime, there's no rain, you know, and the street lights are on just to help you out. Okay? And there's no harm in the middle of the road, there are no cars, nothing, absolutely nothing. It's a straight road and you're driving. Is there anything, any reason why you would swerve off of that road? Can you possibly think of any reason that you would swerve off that road? Why you would swerve off that road? Anybody? There's no problems with the car. Nothing. Everything is fine. It's a hundred percent. It's like the most ideal situation. Something comes and falls across the road. No, nothing falls. There's nothing to fall. The sky is there. The sky is not Open man hole. No, you're not understanding. <laughs> Sorry? You're not going to die. You're driving and there's absolutely nothing to happen. Exactly. You see what's happening? None of you can figure out what is going to come in your way. Because there is nothing to come in your way. As the hadith said, the road is clear. Its night is like its day. It is so obvious. What you need to do is realize that the only thing that can deviate you from this road is you yourself swerving the steering wheel far to the right or far to the left that you actually swerve or veer off the road and deviate yourself. There's nothing else. You yourself are the one that is going to be held accountable. You are the one that deviates yourself. You are the one in control of that steering wheel. You can either hold it straight and go straight to KL or swerve off the road. And that is an example of a person who deviates. Either you yourself work at deviating yourself or you know you keep yourself on that straight path and you go straight to Jannah insha'Allah ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, we're supposed to talk about the importance of studying. And a lot of you are like, please don't start. Please don't talk about studies, please don't talk about exams. Brothers and sisters, very important for you. I will only take maybe two minutes. Very important for you to study. Why do you need to study? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Prophet ﷺ to ask for one thing. He ordered him to ask for one thing. And that is knowledge. Allah asked the Prophet ﷺ to increase him in one thing. Knowledge. The knowledge that you're seeking here may not be Islamic knowledge. But your knowledge can be used to benefit the Muslim Ummah. Your knowledge can be used to help others in the future. With your iman, with your belief, with your help, with your strength, 
you can make the world a better place, both for Muslims and for non-Muslims. When the world is a better place for non-Muslims, they look at the reasons why. How did this happen? Who contributed to it? They look at the Muslims. They succeeded. They were success. You look at examples of, of Andalus. You look at examples of the Muslims in Iraq when they were leading in knowledge and so on. You look at those examples and you think, all of these things I can do as well. We can do together. So study hard. Put the effort in. There's only two or three weeks left. And then your exams are done. This is the time where you need to burn the midnight oil. This is the time where your eyes are red and it feels good. You feel good at the end of the day, you're like, you know what, I put in the effort, you get your marks after, you're like, yes, I strove hard, I did good, and now, what are you going to do? Keep in mind that everything that you do is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, I don't want to take up much time. Everything you do is for the sake of Allah. You purify your intention for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Adnan, please come here. Going to use you again, and What's your name? Omar. Omar. Oh, okay. okay. Just stand here, and Omar stand there. Go sit down. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, what did I just do? Charity. You guys need it? Uh, you can ask them to give you a ring if you want. What I just did is give you an example. One of them, I gave a ring it with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other one, I gave a ring it with the intention of showing off to all of you. I'm super rich. Gave them a ring. It. <laughs> Could you tell the difference? Was there a difference in the way that I gave them the money? Was there a difference in the way that they took the money? Was there a difference in the sum of money? Right hand, left hand? I gave it with the right hand, both of them. <laughs> the only difference there was my intention. And I'm not saying that I did one act for a yeah. I'm doing this for the sake of an example to all of you. That we can do things to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the exact same way that we do it not to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you study for your exams, keep in mind every single day, every time you open another book, I'm doing this to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to help the Muslim Ummah in the future. If I'm becoming an engineer, I'm going to design buildings I'm going to design masajid, I'm going to, I'm going to come up with something that's good for the Muslim Ummah in the, hereafter, uh, in, 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 in the near future. When I go back to my country, when I go somewhere, I'm going to use that knowledge in a beneficial way. If you're good in technology, you're using that technology to benefit the Ummah, to spread hadith and ayat across the internet, to reach others in other countries. Use that knowledge in a good way. I'm going to end there, inshallah, I don't want to take much of your time. I know we don't have much time for question and answer, which is good. So, uh, inshallah, anyone has any questions? It's supposed to be written down. We can take that now, inshallah. <laughs> Two ring it. They gave it back, okay? You're my witness. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, brothers and sisters. I honestly thought we had about 15 minutes left, but it seems as though you guys are more thirsty and hungry than you want to ask questions. So, inshallah, you know, while standing outside or we go for Maghrib, inshallah, if anyone wants to ask any questions, you can do that. Please forgive me for taking up any of your time uh, or extra time. Um, for those of you that I may have offended or done anything wrong, please forgive me. And anything that I did which was good came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khayr wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.